Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for today's chat on Dancing the Archive. My name is Marisa Hayes. I'm a screen dance researcher and curator, and I'm very happy today to be in discussion at the San Francisco Dance Film Festival with me, Karen Perlman, creator of Impossible Image, and Siobhan Davies, creator of Transparent, two films that are screening this year. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. Love to see you. Thanks. Great to see both of you. And thank you so much for your beautiful work. I want to dive in here now and just start with a very basic question, which is, what drew you to working with archival images that are used in both of the films screening this festival? But this is not the first time that you've worked with archival images. Those have been a part of your creative practice. What drew you to working with archive images and what have they opened up in your artistic practice? Well, it is true, as you say, I have been working with archival images for a long time and and um including working with them when performing live years ago but um more recently i've been working in sort of multimodal forms of documentary drama dance film and what drew me to working with archive in the making of films in sort of era of films that i'm working on was really the uh, fluidity and the the brilliance, the kinesthetic brilliance of the archive of the Soviet women editors from the montage era of 19, sort of 25 to 35. And I I just had such a strong feeling for the way that they make images move and the way that they see movement and compose it into patterns of, of dance-like compositions. And this, this has drawn me then into researching their stories as women, their creative practices, the ways that histories has, has overlooked them, the ways that they think that the kind of embodied cognition that they use in their work. And it's just gone on and on. It's got me involved then in, in feminist film histories and the film that's screening at the at the festival at this festival is actually one that uses a whole lot of archive of women from the early 20th century, um, which I encountered when I went to a feminist film history conference and met the curators of this fantastic DVD series called Cinema's First Nasty Women. And I was just completely drawn to these nasty women and, you know, my their my feeling for their bodies and then there's a whole lot of political things that that I then get involved in as well but that's what basically draws me to it in the first instance is the 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 movement feeling that I'm seeing in the images and the edits I love those nasty women they were just fabulous yeah they're um, amazing yeah in in my case, the first film I made, All This Can Happen, is absolutely uses archival imagery between um, the 1860s and the 1920s. In Transparent, um, in a way, I was trying to be honest about my archival history as a dancer, but but when I looked at it, strangely, it had very little dance movement in it. It had loads of imagery about um, uh, from visual art, from animal movement, from anatomy, from um, glimpses, glimpses of the things that had lit me up in the past. And I wanted to try and make a sort of constellation of these glimpses, which to me is more truthful about what it's like to be a dancer than it would be if I put a piece of traditional dance on the screen. So it was a question of remembering those things that had altered my attitude towards what dancing and why I would dance. And it wasn't only that I would dance, it would I would dance because I had an inbuilt sensation within me having seen or experienced something else. And that made me dance. I think that's wonderful. Maybe that's a good jumping off point to talk also about the role of editing, which is often so central in use of the archive. So when you talk about the kind of movement that you feel from the images and the kinesthesia that that might inspire in the viewer, can you tell us a little bit about that editing process? I know 
that Sue, you worked with um, two collaborators on the film. And Karen, you also have a very um, vast background in editing. That's one of your specialties. So I know you'll have things to say about editing as well, but maybe we can jump off with Sue and talk about that sense of movement that we feel from the use of archival images and the way they're constructed. In this film, I had two co-directors look after different sections, David Hinton and Hugo Glendinning, but we also had the animation artist Noriko Okaku, uh, who is just brilliant. And she was the one who was working in Japan at the time. So our time difference was, you know, was fun. Um, but she has a very brilliant way of us giving her a problem about how to overlay images because a lot of her work in transparent was based on my work with using transparent paper. And if you have lay one image on top of another, then a third thing happens and Noriko was uh, extraordinary in how she would deal with the complexities we would give her with these overlaying images and then the side by side nature of the work because quite often there are two or three images in the same frame um, sometimes had to be very straightforward because all of the images were particularly the visual art images were owned by organizations in which we had to adhere to their demands about how we were allowed to show them. So there were some places in which the, the, the frame had to be side by side. So our sense of timing, my, our editorial timing would be slightly altered by those rules. I think a lot of it is about juxtaposition. So the juxtaposition of one image next to another when you time how to place, there was, there's very little fading in it, but when there's a quite clear, clear use of editing, it's quite clipped, it's quite clear that sense. But when you decide how long you hold, all of those things are for me choreographic because I'm not a film editor. So I would use whatever I had learned as a choreographer to support my methodology for when and how something would be on the screen. Mm. And there you have it, folks. That's the deal. <laughs> As you know, I was a, a dancer for many years and a choreographer working with my partner, Richard James Allen, and making works touring the world. Um, and um, when I stopped dancing, I really looked for something I could do, how I could, what, what are the social uses of all of this sort of kinesthetic intelligence I'm carrying with me? Like, what else can I do? And I landed on, on film editing, which, as you know, Marissa, I then did a PhD and theorized mm -hmm. film editing as a form of choreography. And my PhD is on rhythm in film editing. So it's all about timing, pacing, trajectory, phrasing, all of these kinds of choreographic ideas that really are the same ideas in film editing. But um, what I've sort of been learning in the last six or eight years as I've been working on, on the Soviet women is that my ideas about editing as a form of choreography start there. They And they really had those ideas. And, you know, what's uh, super interesting about the women in the you know this this Russian constructivist women and and um is that in film history we remember the men you know Eisenstein mm -hmm. Vertov and these are the these are the great montage makers and the montage theorists but the editors were all women and mm -hmm. the, you know <laughs> so so it it became very much a a, a feminist thing in a in a way of um, kind of quietly constructing a world um, through the creative process of editing, and and as Sue says, this idea of juxtaposition is is everything. In in it's you know, and and where I'm trying to push it now is not just can I, not just can I make patterns that draw you in emotionally or draw you in physically, but can I actually create ideas through the juxtaposition of of different temporal frames or gestures or word, sounds and, and images. And that's what I'm working on in the new film. Thank you. And I think that when we talk about archive, we can't avoid a discussion of time. 
and not to do it a disservice because there are so many layers that we could discuss in relationship to time. But there's something that struck me in both of your films, an idea perhaps that archive permits the sort of intergenerational discussion that is coming up in both of them. And I know in your film, Karen, Impossible Image, you actually used the word intergenerational. But Sue, I think that it's subtle, but they're threaded throughout your film, not just in looking back into your past, present, and future as an artist, but also you mention your grandchildren, and there opens up this space for this discussion of intergenerational collaboration, overlap, evolution, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a bit to that and also how the archive generated such a discussion. Well, here I am sort of a good 50 years on from beginning as a dancer. And there are, um, quite often dance is uh, spoken in terms of the now and the present and the fleeting na nature of the present. And I think I've enjoyed that sensation, but I am more aware now of the long arc and the long arc that my and all of our bodies have taken from conception. <laughs> and inevitably, I'm that much closer to dying than I was. So that long arc of a physical experience suddenly begins to have a kind of tender value to me. And uh, that's why I, I mentioned uh, my granddaughter is there because she re-taught me that idea of how you learn on the go when you're tiny. And it's enormous. It's an enormous dance practice. <laughs> so I, I just fell in love with a dance practice again through hers. She didn't know she was having a dance practice. She was just learning how to survive in the world. But it, it is, it's just wonderful to observe. And then to observe myself in relationship to her and aging and all of the things in between and all of the things in between our movement, our movement and change. So we are very fortunate as dance practitioners who then align ourselves with that other brilliant medium, which is movement and change, which is film. So I think our alignment between dance and film is very, um, is very expansive for us. And uh, I just happen to take the idea of time, although occasionally you have to have split second time in a film, is this edit perfect? But I place that split second timing within the arc of a much longer life, which is sort of, um, I am reminding myself the experiences that I, the movement, the many movement experiences that I've had. I, I love that idea of, of so seeing children as a, as a dance practice or seeing this <laughs> learn to navigate the world as a dance practice. I, I feel, I feel so sad watching it be hammered out of children. I have to say, you know, don't, you know, when, 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 Kids are little, you know, what, what is the, what is this chair for? Well, you can stand on it. You can curl up in it. You can flip over it. It's all, it, and no, no, the chair is only for sitting in. Don't put your, you know, it gets hammered out. It's, it's very um, unfortunate. And mm. um, I mean, to, to segue into from, from that idea of movement becoming more constrained to what I'm doing with impossible image. I, I really felt when looking at the, the slapstick comedians and the cross-dressed cowgirls of the early 20th century, that they had this kind of wildness yeah. to their movement that was like, what happened? Why are we so much more polite? You know, why are we so much more contained? You know, how did that get hammered out of us? I mean, they were wearing corsets. The corsets are off, but we are so mm -hmm. much more um, controlled in, in our social interactions than what you see with them on the screen so I, I in a way I'm, I'm traveling back in time to to kind of rehabilitate some of that wildness back into our into our physicality as well what kind of information did you give, did you give your young very beautiful dance artists what kind of information did you give them or permission or loudness could you give them to be able to take on that material I mean I know they're not copying it 
but there's, no, no, no. you're trying they, to release they, something in them. They are and they aren't. So what I did in um, what I did was I, I I cut together a whole series of archive gestures. I kind of, you know, I, I just pulled them out and cut them mm -hmm. together and made different phrases of archive gestures. And then I would say I would I showed them to the dancers and I asked them to learn them. So they would, you know, do that. They would learn them. And they look completely different. And then I'd say, okay, that's great. That'll be the beginning of your phrase. Now make your version of it. What's going on here? You know, what is, what's happening in the body? You know, give me something around this kind of rage that we're seeing or this kind of, um, mayhem that that is being created and so then you know they work they you know each of them kind of developed um specific characters that they became attached to from the archive and developed their own sort of characters around that bit of archive that they were intrigued by um so yeah they really i mean that i, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a political dimension to to all of this for me and and the politics have to do with feminisms over the last 120 years or so. You know, we sort of talk about the first wave of feminism, and that was what they were doing in the early 20th century. And then there's this sort of second wave, which I'm just right on the cusp of. My mother was a, a solid second wave feminist. And then um, and then there was this third wave, fourth wave, fifth wave. It goes on and on now. You know, every wants to differentiate themselves but I felt there was something some really kind of misapprehensions going on in the third wave of feminists about what women were doing in those first and second waves and I felt like well if I can if I can make an image where these two ideas of of women in motion connect maybe I can change the understanding that women have of what their mothers and grandmothers actually were up to. Um, I'm wondering for our public, if you can tell us a little bit about what it's like working with the image and your process, because I think your films are both, I don't want to limit them to, to one category, of course, but they are very generous in sharing a lot of information about process, about evolution of creative practice and that's interwoven into both of your films um, but I'm also thinking Sue that I had the pleasure of seeing hundreds if not thousands of transparency sheet photographs at a presentation when you were preparing your film some years ago and I'm wondering how do you go into the belly of the beast of the archive? What is that process like for you, selecting the images, working through them? How do you respond to them? Initially, I collected loads of uh, blank postcards and I wrote on them a moment that I'd been in a gallery and seen something or a sentence from a book or uh, that I'd seen something in the street. And I just collected all of these postcards and they were scattered all over the place and I'd lose them and then I'd find them again and then I, that I realized that I was living in this flat house full of postcards and maybe I should draw them together. So I drew them together, uh, but I didn't like the, um, uh, the being encapsulated on white paper. So I printed out the images, first of all, on um, tracing paper. And I wondered why tracing paper and it was partly because they weren't as fixed. So they wouldn't be a fixed memory and they wouldn't, they could be interfered with by another image on another piece of tracing paper. And then gradually I got brave enough and put them on acetate, which is totally see-through paper. And then they would start to interfere with each other. So I was digging into images or words or experiences that I genuinely had had like all of the because my uh, family went to um, galleries a lot and then I continued to go to galleries or I would um, I would go for walks and a landscape would matter to me or I would see an animal and an animal would matter to me and I collected the ones that genuinely had struck a chord within me and then after a while they slightly expand because when you're trying to find them genuinely on archive for the film, you then find that you have to slightly adjust your the image that you can find or can use. 
which led one to more images. So, I mean, there are close to about 800 <laughs> of them all on transparent paper. And so the, the digging is kind of digging into the memory and the memory needs to be a physical memory, not a memory that would make a nice design. So placing and one image either on top of another or side by side, I had to be very careful not to say, oh, that looks nice. I had to go, what does it feel like? And it's important that what it felt like was why you would place something close together rather than it looked attractive. I mean, inevitably you want something to look nice, but it had to, it had to have a sort of gut feeling. It almost you sounds like it, it can't look nice unless it feels right. It's yes. you're working from this uh, kinetic sensibility about where the, the embodied memory is and how yes. it feels then becomes what shapes it as an, as an image. Because then it would be more honest to what I think a dance practice is like. So although the film is visual, <laughs> for me, it's a dance practice, but it needed to feel like a dance practice because I think quite often we look at we we look at dance. I mean, we look at film, but we must feel it. We have to, it has to give us that sensation of which sound helps also extraordinarily. But I know we haven't got there yet, but I suddenly felt I yes. that welled up in me that idea. Karen, what about you? How do you dive into the archive and work with the the infinite possibilities that exist there? Well, what what Sue is saying about how it feels is is highly resonant for me. Although I will say that I was a really really good dancer. I mean, I, I don't say that as like oh yay me or anything because because <laughs> what it meant for me is that I wasn't really a very good choreographer. It's like I couldn't pull myself away nothing ever looked like it felt when it was on other dancers to me and so it was a there was a real relief to me to not be present in the images that I was editing to only work from how they feel and that's very much how I encounter the archive is 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 by feel is by movement feeling um in impossible image I was you know, work with these amazing collaborators, um, Maggie Hannafeld, uh, Laura Horak, and Alif Rangan Kainaski. And the three of them spent years in archives, decades, searching and finding and restoring and, you know, recovering and, you know, put collecting these 99 films that are on the cinema's first Nasty Women DVD collection. And so I didn't have to do any of that. To me, I just encountered the 99 fil films. And what I did with them was I I brought them, I watched them in my editing gear. And as I watched them, I started sorting them into different things. So there was things like jumping out windows and kissing and um, mayhem and um, fists. And, you know, I just, I just kept sorting the gestures in these, in these ways so that I could tag them, tag the gestures and then return to and find them as gestures and, and really develop phrases out of them that I then, that I then gave to the dancers. So I never inserted my body into, into that process at all, only from their bodies to the dancers' bodies and the actors. And a lot of the dancers are actors as well. So, or actors first, which means that they, have this kind of a, a different approach again to to have when something a, a feeling a movement feeling for them is an is of, often more a, like a a thought or an emotional uh feeling that then becomes physical as opposed to the dancer taking it the other direction so that was very fruitful way of encountering the archive as well Excellent. And since Sue brought up the use of sound, which is so central in both of your films, and I think it often is something lacking in screen dance discussions, I think we have a tendency to forget that sound is a form of movement because it's invisible, and nonetheless, it is movement and it moves us. So I'd love to dive into the use of sound in your both of your films because it's very varied in terms of having voiceover or interviews, um, a, a big mix of diegetic sound and also soundtrack uh, composed music. So I'd love to hear about how you approached sound and how that relates to movement and choreography in the film. When I 
quit dancing, which is not something you can ever really do. But I, you know, I said, I said, okay, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to go to film school. And I, and I went to the national film school in Australia, the Australian film television radio school. And um, I got trained as an editor and very, very trained um, and very, um, this is how we do it in capital I industry, the film industry. Um, but one, but the, lots of that was has been incredibly fruitful for me in bringing back to to dance film and documentary. And also, I will say at this point, the producer that I work with, Richard James Allen, is incredibly committed to sound. And a lot of producers kind of stop. You know, you get to the editing, and they're like, "Okay, that's fine," and we'll leave it there. But but Richard's very committed to sound, so we're both very committed to sound. And what we draw on is actually the processes that are used in drama. So this means that there are layers of sound that include, um, you know, it's up to hundreds sometimes of, of layers of different sound that go into making the, the sound effects, the sound atmospheres, and most importantly for dance, the Foley. So Foley is um, intentional body sound. So it isn't just the sound the body makes, but it's the sound the body. It's it's in the it's in the phrasing and timing of the way the body is moving, but it's it's slightly constructed to give it um, an intentional edge, an emotional edge, or a psychological edge, or something that expresses something a little bit beyond just cloth moving on cloth kind of sound. I mean, we spend as much money on sound as we spend on shooting. It's a very significant part of what we're doing. When I was still working in, well, gallery spaces rather than theatres, um, I was involved with others making work mostly to silence. And I had chosen silence because when I used music, the music dictated the emotion and the structure and the rhythm of everything. And I thought, hold on, if you're going to be a choreographer, um, don't rely on another art form to um, overly influence or color uh, how the outcome would be felt or perceived by an audience. So then I come to film. And again, in the first film, I come across a sound artist called Chuli Shuring. And um, there's, there's, there's no Foley in any of the films and there's, um, voice over uh, in both these films. So that becomes an extraordinary learning curve for me who knows nothing is I think, well, I just, I just speak. But they're saying, well, where do you speak? And how do you speak? And how intimate are you? And how far away and how close are you? And what else is happening? And who are you reacting to? And what are you reacting to? So that makes me suddenly very aware of every single sound that is being constructed and in our case they're all constructed and then how that uh, broaches the distance between the screen and the and the audience because it seems to fill that void in a in such a the sound seems to fill the void nearly more than the image does. So the whole thing becomes a 360 degree um, experience. So I learned a huge amount by working with the sound artists involved in these films. I think it's, in, I think it's interesting the, the way that you mentioned music and I, I really would underline mm. that as an incredibly important principle, this idea. I, I do a lot of teaching now and I, I do not let my students edit to music. No, 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 no. <laughs> Music has its own form. It has its own rhythms and it will fool you into thinking your, your images are working. Just no music until you make a rhythm and then bring in a composer to work with the rhythms mm -hmm. that are intrinsic to the film and not something that you, you, you put, you know, you put, it's like putting a whole structure on your film and then trying to make your film conform to it. It's, really um similar again another another thing is very similar to this the choreographic process thank you both of you i'm aware of the fact that we just have a short amount of time to discuss today and i thought i might conclude by asking you uh, what's next for the archive what remains to be done in the archive that you would like to explore creatively 
So I'll just say um, Impossible Image is actually a short dance film festival cut down version of a film that's now 25 minutes long um, that we have just finished. Well, it's nearly finished. We're doing a, a preview screening here in Melbourne, Australia tomorrow. Um, first ever time in front of an audience just before we lock it all off to make sure it's doing what we want it to do. And um, and so that the... I'm working with the same set of archive. There was not only this eight minute film in that set of archive, but another 25 minute film. And there could be more, I think, in fact. Um, but I also have, I mean, I, 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 again, this idea of these, these feminisms across time, women's movement, women in motion. I'd really love to get a project going, an idea I have for a project that, that has, Th sort of three three moments in time across it that has this early 20th century that has a mid-century the 50s 60s 70s and then that has the present and um yeah I, I it's, it's 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 a magical kind of idea to me that I really want to put those those moments in conversation with each other at this level of the the physical interchange uh, across generations I really okay. look forward to to seeing that and to experiencing that, Karen, it sounds extraordinary. At the moment, I'm quite involved with a group of filmmakers who are using material that they find online. And because it's suddenly this online availability is huge from when you and I began to make films, certainly when we, we were dancing, none of that was available. So it's how to build a proper relationship with that, that is fair and clear. But on the other hand, you know, not to dismiss that there is this extraordinary amount of information that might be available to us as filmmakers and how to use it honourably and how to use, how to think of it as bringing, um, you know, bringing women from another century forward into now and uh, allow them to re-exist in the present, which seems incredibly exciting to me. So I'm sort of looking more at that um, place right now and loving it. Thank you. I think that's such an important point. Um, we have a lot of interest in found footage, but we also have established archives that, as you mentioned, Sue, are really opening up their collections of both still yeah. and moving images. And we've entered into a phase where we really think about restoring the timeline in terms of really looking back to restitute things in the present to right wrongs that have happened and also to imagine possible futures and I think that archive is something that really allows for that plural sense of, of time and, and hope for the future as well. <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you. It's just been a joy to spend time with both of your films, Siobhan Davies uh, Transparent and uh, Karen Perlman's Impossible Image and I wanted to thank both of you as well as Claire and the team at the San Francisco Dance Film Festival for hosting this discussion. And I hope we get to do it again. We've just begun to skim the surface of what's possible with archive. <laughs>